Hello everyone! Welcome! I need to put a necklace on. Okay, what are we putting on? H2O necklace? No, that doesn't go well with this outfit. We're gonna put the the crystal heart that looks like it's from Ella Enchanted. Hugh Dancy, where are you? Wanna fall in love with me? I'll sing somebody to love. Um, hello everyone! Welcome! We're gonna deal with the terrible lighting as usual, but you've been doing that on my channel since I've been here, so ha! In this segment, this new segment I'm making up on the spot, monthly kind of wrap-ups of like different entertainment that I have devoured this month, I guess you could say. Originally my my com like my coming back video was going to be a college Q&A, but um, I wasn't vibing with the footage that I did, so and also I don't want to put out a video that I'm not proud of as my first video back. So we're gonna go with this one and see how that goes, because Julia will talk about different media they consumed this month to get through, I don't know, life. So. <laughs> Let's get started. The first TV show I, I want to talk on my list is Hannibal. But here's the thing, I already watched Hannibal. I, I watched Hannibal first in J January, so this is kind of cheating. However, I'm re-watching it, so it's fine. Everything is fine. Um, Hannibal is one of my favorite TV shows uh, ever. It's like in my top three. It goes Lost, Hannibal, and then Haunting of Hill House. I think Lost is superior over all of them, but then like Hannibal and like Haunting of Hill House can like fight to the death. My long, my story with Hannibal, my my life story with Hannibal started out in January. I had to quarantine for four days to be on campus for my college. And I wanted to start a new show before I started my, my second semester of my freshman year of college. So originally I started off with the new Winx Club series. So I started watching the remake, it was awful. and. I was like, okay, I need to find something new on Netflix to watch because I, I just can't, I can't watch this. This is awful. I was like, okay, what's the one show on Netflix that I've heard really good things about, things about that I should watch? I heard Hannibal's good, so I decided to start watching Hannibal and it's turned into one of my favorite TV shows of all time. Because why not? Why not rewatch Hannibal? If you don't know what Hannibal is, it is kind of in the Hannibal universe. I love that there's a cinematic universe of Hannibal, the cannibal serial killer. There's Marvel, there's DC, there's Barbie, and then you have Hannibal. <laughs> the main character is Will Graham, who's this FBI investigator, and he's like wrapped up in like solving serial killers because he can kind of get into the mind of it, and it's kind of like hard for him. So enter Hannibal Lecter, who we all know is a cannibal, but no one in this show knows that. And he is like his therapist, and they go on adventures, and that's my pitch to you to watch Hannibal if you're age appropriate. It's so good. Hugh Dancy, Mads Mikkelsen are so good in this. I remember when I first made my first Chaos Walking video and I was like, ah, Mads Mikkelsen can't play the villain. And then so many people yelled at me because they're like, no, he's Hannibal Lecter. I understand the hype now, all right? I understand you people yelling at me in the comments from a video in 2017. But yeah, Hannibal's so good, like so good. And rewatching it is so different because you see these characters in a place that they weren't in the end and the journey, and you know their journey and how they get there, and it's so interesting. Um, the next show that I watch is actually a show I never watched, <laughs> and that is Invincible. I don't know how, why I watch this show so quickly, because usually with shows when people recommend me shows, I'm like, yeah, I'll watch it, and then I just put it on a long list and probably never watch it. I have two friends, don't know each other whatsoever. In about a week difference between the two, they both recommended me Invincible. So I feel like if two people that don't know each other whatsoever, and in a, like, in a few days, they both recommend me the shame show. I kind of feel like I need to watch it. If you don't know what Invincible is, it's basically a animated adaptation of like a comic book series that came out in 2006 who's done by the same creator of The Walking Dead. Superheroes live in our world and this kid is the son of like their Superman, Omni-Man, and just going on his wacky, zany adventures, that's not really what the tone is. And I know that a lot of people will look at this show and be like, oh, this has been overdone. But when Invincible came out, like as the comic book series, this was a new idea, this was a new tone and everything. And with this show, it makes it new. It feels refreshing and different because of the characters in the story. I do also warn, it is MA, like Hannibal. It's, it's bloody and gory. And you think since it's animated, it's not gonna affect you as much. <laughs> no, no, it's gonna affect you a lot. Um, a lot of shows what they do is use blood and gore as a shock value rather than, you know, affecting you emotionally and stuff like that. But that's what I think Invincible does so well is that it uses the blood and gore for a reason. It just doesn't use it, use it for shock value. It uses it for emotional. You have this 16 year old kid who's going through so much and seeing so much blood and violence in the world 
it's gonna um, affect him emotionally. Also, the voice acting is fantastic. Obviously, you have J.K. Simmons. He's gonna do great because he's he's done voice acting and he's J.K. Simmons. You have Sandra Oh. He, she does a great job. Uh, Steven Yoon has done a really good. There's other great people in that voice acting cast and I think everyone does such a great job. But yeah, Invincible. The last show I have to recommend and totally, totally different from the last two shows I've just talked about that is getting me through May is High School Musical the Musical the Series season two because season two is the one that's releasing right now. I remember when High School Musical the Musical the Series was announced and everyone pitchforks and knives go into the Disney headquarters and be like why did you take my childhood of High School Musical and put it down a garbage disposal and I was one of the people that was like this sounds like an interesting concept of taking the movies of High School Musical but not putting it in the same universe of High School Musical but kind of putting it in a universe like ours where the movies exist. So if you don't know the plot of High School Musical the musical the series it's basically the kids at East High where High School Musical was filmed puts on a production of High School Musical and then the second season they're you know they're gonna do High School Musical 2 they think but no because the teacher wants to compete against her ex-boyfriend so they put on a production of Beauty and the Beast a tale as old as time a song as old as rhyme um I was close with guessing what they were gonna do the second season did I hope it was Little Mermaid yes but the other school's doing Little Mermaid so I feel like I was right in a way. I, I like the direction this season is going. I like the characters that they are focusing on. Nini and Ricky, like they're enjoyable enough, but are they my favorite characters? No. <laughs> I love Ashlyn and I'm so glad that she's getting the spotlight that she deserves. Julia Lester is like a very, very talented individual. Um, same thing with Courtney, that character. She's kind of coming into her own and she's doing her own storyline. It's nice to see all the characters kind of be friends after the events of the first season because I liked that kind of community aspect. So yeah, I am excited to see where this se season goes. The first movie I started off this uh, month with was uh, Star Wars The Force Awakens. My friend and I decided that we would watch a Star Wars movie together for May the 4th. Force Awakens, I loved it when it came out. I didn't love it as much as I did the first time, but it's still an enjoyable experience. You have Daisy Ridley and John Boyega, their beginning of their big stardom, and you can clearly see both of them doing a great job. And immensely John Boyega. His charisma is perfect. He's such a great actor. He's really good. I, I love John Boyega. I think he's gonna do amazing things and I wish they gave him more screen time. Same thing with Oscar Isaac. I think both of them have such great chemistry because I don't want to say anything else to piss off the Star Wars fans. So the next movie I watched was Whisper of the Heart, which is a Studio Ghibli film. And I love Studio Ghibli. Um, you can't see it, but I have Gigi from Kiki's Delivery Service, a movie I still have not watched. The animation's gorgeous. The storylines are so real and raw and the characters feel raw and real in any of the movies you watch, no matter if it's fantasy, or just like kind of slice of life kind of thing. And that's kind of what Whisper of the Heart is, which I didn't know going into it. Miyazaki just has this beautiful energy and this like kind of like, you feel like you he knows the, the answer to life and is just not letting us know. He talks about a lot of real life things, but it's kind of patting you on the back saying you don't know these answers and that's okay. And it's really sweet. Like I remember I just turned this on while I was writing like in my journal and stuff and I just like got immersed in the world and the characters and it's so sweet and kind and like I really needed that before my like finals. It just was like this kind of like everything will be okay. It's nice to have that company there and I think this is one of my favorite ones. I do have a soft spot for Castle in the Sky and I do have a soft spot for ha Howl's Moving Castle and Princess Fawn and okay but I think this one like written like the script itself and then the storyline itself is just it's it's just a character study it just a character growing up and it's really really sweet to see that and see a character doubt themselves and I think I really needed that. After Whisper the Heart the next movie I watched was When Harry Met Sally and the reason why I watched When Harry Met Sally was I had to do a coverage for my class which basically is a book report for a movie screenplay. And one of the screenplays that our teachers allowed was When Harry Met Sally. And the teacher said we weren't supposed to do one that we watched, but I hadn't seen When Harry Met Sally in a while. So I guess that kind of counted. When Harry Met Sally, I've always enjoyed. I always enjoy Nora, Nora Ephron's movies. I really love her rom-coms. I think they're just very fresh and new and the dialogue's always like, 
love her characters, especially anything that Meg Ryan and Tom Hanks are in together. Like Meg Ryan and Billy Crystal have great charisma and chemistry together. Their characters are very, very vivid and strong. And I love seeing Carrie Fisher and I love the fall energy and I love the outfits. Like I want to dress like both Billy Crystal and Meg Ryan in this film. Like they both are fashionably be dressed. The next film I watched is kind of funny because the reason why I watched it was because long story short, my family and I stayed in an Airbnb, but not for long because there was a rat in it. And I constantly made references to Ratatouille, even though I had never seen Ratatouille since it came out. And like, I don't know what it is with this generation, but this generation is really obsessed with Ratatouille for some reason. And I never really got the hype. Like all my friends in college were always like, yeah, Ratatouille. And I was always like, the movie about the rat that cooks, that's the, that's the Pixar film you're obsessed with. But like, it's understandable now after rewatching it. I, I get the hype now, everyone. I get the hype because Ratatouille is more than just anyone can cook. It's, it's, it's more than that. It's, it's so much more than that. Brad Bird's films are so much more than what they're, the, that they're advertising you because he puts so much themes and character building into his work. So like Ratatouille, yes, the plot is a rat cooking, but it's about aspirations and not letting critics get down and it's one of the most greatest animated films of all time and it's beautifully animated as usual with Pixar and I, I just don't have a lot of to say because it's just easy right there when you it's kind of like the, the the plot of High School Musical if you think about it so Ratatouille is High School Musical um I will be taking no criticism about that that was a joke all my friends who like Ratatouille are going to yell at me but after watching Ratatouille I watched a Barbie movie and you don't need to know my opinion on that because you all know that I freaking love my Barbie movies. My friend and I watched 12 Dancing Princesses and that was fun. 12 Dancing Princesses is personally in my like top three favorite Barbie movies. I love 12 Dancing Princesses not only just because this is the one prince that had a different character design and he's actually like a good character and he has a nice face. It's just a nice story and like you could make a fun of Barbie as much as you want but like I love Barbie. Yes yeah, so I would love to write a Barbie movie because I would be allowed to have crazy hijinks happen based on a, a doll. I think that sounds fun. So following Barbie, my friend and I discovered a connection to another part of our childhood. And that was that two voice actors in Barbie 12 Dancing Princesses were in the uh, live action remake of Scooby-Doo. <laughs> Not the one you're thinking of, the one where they're teenagers in high school and it's kind of the mystery begin. That one I don't hate as a lot of people do. Is it the best one? No. Yes, this is the one where Fred has no blonde hair. Anytime I talk about Scooby-Doo with my dad, he'll always try to bring up that Fred has brunette hair in this one. And it's very funny. He'll like jab fun at it. And then I'm like, it's not that bad. And then I realized that I made so much like annoyance with Annabeth having brunette hair and Percy Jackson. And then I just called myself a hypocrite. This movie's like not good. The mystery's not good. The storyline's not good. The dialogue's not good. Those poor actors. I think Kaylee Kiyoko is the only famous one out of all of them. Like, yeah, there's one that's like the cousin of Arrow and is in CW, but I'm just saying being lesbian Jesus is more famous than that. The next thing I watched after that one is the Mitchell vs. the Machines, which is this uh, animated movie that's made a lot of buzz and producers of Into the Spider-Verse. So obviously it's gonna be like fun and different, but it still has that heart. And I really, really loved that about this movie. I think it's very, very funny. And I think the animation's done nicely. It's very different. It's very new and raw. The next film I watched was another animated film. It was The Incredibles. Now after Ratatouille, I want to do kind of like a ranking of Brad Bird's films because I think his filmmaking is really cool because earlier this year my friend and I watched The Iron Giant. I watched it for the first time. He watched it for however many times he's watched Iron Giant and we sobbed our eyes out. I've been really interested in Brad Bird's work because I've heard what he's said about things and I think his, the the perspectives he has on the like animated film industry is super interesting and I really want to watch all his films and then they kind of do like one of those videos where I rank all his films and I watch all his films. Incredibles is a superhero film but not really. When I was watching it I was like yeah this has superhero aspects but that's not like the main driving force of this film. Like the main driving force of this film is you have this character that lost what he loves and then is like being able to get back to it but he has a new dream or something like that. It's much more than a superhero film. It's it's more of a family story and a father. What you're supposed to do as a filmmaker is put things that reference to other things later in the film but I think Brad Bird does it better than everyone else. Does it especially well in Iron Giant 
but also Incredibles. It's not my favorite one of his, like you'll see my ranking and everything if that goes well. Um, the last film that I watched, uh, I watched it on uh, May 27th, so I'm gonna say that I ended it on May 27th, is The Holiday, which is a holiday film. It's a, it's a winter film. And you may think to yourself, Julia, why the hell did you watch a, a holiday film in the month of May? My friend and I joked about writing a rom-com script and I was like, well, if I'm gonna write a rom-com script, I have to watch like one of my favorite rom-coms and that's The Holiday. Wait, okay, The Holiday is not my favorite rom-com, but it's one of those that I can like always go back to. Like my mom and I always watch The Holiday. If you don't know what The Holiday is, it's basically Cameron Diaz and Kate Winslet switch places. Uh, not, not like body switching, they, like, they literally switch places aka houses. So like you have Kate Winslet's character who's like so used to the small town of her England city and then you have Cameron Diaz who's this big Taylor, Taylor? Trailer editor and she's used to the LA scene and just kind of being around other people in this big city and then they kind of like switch kind of environments and it brings out this new kind of thing in them. Here's a little secret. This movie could do without Cameron Diaz's character. I'm not a Cameron Diaz hater. This is like one of the only films besides Shrek that I've really seen her in. I've never seen Charlie's Angels. I don't know. She's in Charlie's Angels, right? Yeah, she is. Okay. Like her plot is just not as interesting as Kate Winslet. Maybe it's just me who relates more to Kate Winslet's character than Cameron Diaz's character, but Kate Winslet's character is going through a lot. Is, has this unrequited love with this guy that's treated her like her like trash for three years and then she's finally going to a different place and realizing herself and she's friends with Jack Black and she's friends with this old 90 year old guy who was this famous screenwriter back in like the old Hollywood day and that's more with film and I guess maybe that's why it's more interesting to me and like yeah I guess having the dual different storylines is okay. When you have two storylines you have to make both of them super interesting and super different and have interesting characters there and just personally I always want to stick with where Kate Winslet's storyline's going and like her ending is so satisfying compared to Cameron Diaz like yeah I'm fine with Cameron Diaz getting with Jude Law like that's fine but I just think Kate Winslet's storyline of her being friends with the old guy and her having a friendship with Jack Black's character and then kind of ending in a romance but you're not it's not really being forced so that is it for the movies that I watched in May let's go to books I didn't read a lot this May. So I reread the Heartstopper comics by Alice Oseman because they recently just announced the cast for the live action Netflix adaptation. And I just loved them. Those, they're, these books are so, so good. Like these, they're just so sweet and soft. And like, yes, there is so much serious issues being discussed, but it's handled with such care. And obviously, thankfully there's trigger warnings. So if you are uncomfortable with some of the topics being discussed in these books, um, especially in the UK editions at least, they are given to you, those trigger warnings are given to you, and read the webcomic, those trigger warnings are also given. And it's also just, you have the story of these characters and they feel so nice and raw and you want to be friends with all of them. But if you don't know the story of Heartstoppers, basically there's this kid, Charlie, and he's the only, only like openly gay uh, boy at his all boys school. And then you have uh, Nick, who's kind of this like soft, rugby that's that's the sport in england and they become friends and then it becomes more and like nick discovers himself as being bi like i never really read another book where a character's journey throughout the book is discovering their sexuality or gender so it, it was nice to see that and i've already i always connected to nick's character i'm so excited for this live action series and i need to buy the fourth edition even though I'm caught up with the webcomic. The other book that I tried to read this month, the spo Spoiler Alert by Olivia Day, Dead, Dad? I'm 19, so I don't know how to read. I'm always a sucker for famous people being in love with normal people because you know me, I grew up on Starstruck. Basically this plot follows a like actor who's like a fan of like this book series, the book series that his TV show is based off of, but it's not really based off of it. It's like a terrible adaptation. He's like in the fan fiction world and he and this girl, the main character is kind of in love with each other, but it's mostly their friends, but they have feelings for each other. But then she posts a cosplay of one of the characters and he kind of defends her and they start a relationship, but without knowing that they already know each other. And I just love those kinds of stories. Like I'm a sucker for internet relationships. I'm a sucker for that. I'm a sucker for someone, someone being famous, but them not knowing it. This book is fine and I still have not finished it. It's just, it's a romance like adult romance. And sometimes it, it's hard for me to get into adult romance for personal reasons. 
nothing much is happening. Like, I, I was enjoying it, and then it, like, kind of, like, stopped having a plot. Get it! Most of your plot is just them doing it, but, like, there has to be more! Those were the books that I read in May, or at least started in May. Let's finish off this video with music. Um, what music have I been listening to for the past month? Well, if you all know, Olivia Rodrigo's Sour album came out, and that's all I've been listening to. Sour is a really good album. It's a great debut album. Just the, the music is amazing. Yeah, it's teenage because she's a teenager. The way that a lot of the songs on Sour, you can relate in different ways besides like romantic relationships. Like you can relate to Sour with multiple different relationships. You can do it with friends, family, um, other people. Like that's how the power of music is, is that you can interpret it in your own way and stuff like that. My personal favorite is Brutal. I love Brutal. It's the song that I skateboard to constantly. What's the line? She's like, I'm not pretty. I'm not smart. I can't even parallel park, I believe is the lyric. If I'm wrong, Julia, editing Julia can correct me. And I'm not cool and I'm not smart and I can't even parallel park. I think my favorite down song is probably either Happier or uh, Enough For You. I think those songs are really pretty too. Also, I Hope You're Okay makes me sob. Another kind of uh, like artist I've been listening to most of this month to survive is Mother Mother, which I'm surprised that I like because originally starting out my year, I did try to get into Mother Mother, but then I just couldn't do it. But with Mother Mother, their music is so unique that you have to kind of like listen to a few to get into it and uh, that's another that's another artist that i love to listen to while i skateboard it's really nice i've been trying to listen to their album straight through twice before adding it to my playlist and listening to the songs more my friends didn't think that i had edgy enough music so i was like all right recommend me mother mother songs and here we are there's two songs that i've been listening to constantly that aren't a part of albums or anything um being alive from company but specifically the version with the dude that plays Chilton in Hannibal. That's my only connection to tell you who sings this version of Company. But that this version is just so emotional. Being Alive is a very emotional number and it deserves to be at the end of Company. Never seen Company in my life, so I wouldn't know. Maybe that will be on my movie list next. I really love Being Alive. Doesn't matter what time of the day it is, 9 a.m., 12 a.m., I will be sobbing at that song when it comes on. So like, if I'm listening to Being Alive, I'm probably crying, so. And last song to talk about that I've been listening to is Let Me Try by Rachel Zegler. Now I'm a huge Rachel Zegler fan. Like I watched her covers and I was subscribed to her and then obviously the news broke out that she was gonna be in West Side Story and I was like, oh my God, I'm so proud of her. So now I just like follow her and I just love to see what she's doing. Also now she's in Shazam too, which is amazing because I love Shazam. Let Me Try is just like one of those like, she has like a guitar, it's just her singing, and it's just really sweet and soft, and I really hope she releases more music, and I love listening to the song while I'm driving to places, so yeah. So that is my media wrap-up for the month. I hope you all enjoyed. I hope you would like, comment, and subscribe, comment down below some movies and TV shows and music and books you read this month. Thank you all for watching. Bye.